Hi, this is Jim Cunningham. How do wealthy people structure estates to reduce taxes? Stay tuned. And this is a good one. So if you've got over 5 million in assets, you're going to want to watch this. Hi, this is Jim Cunningham, and we're going to talk about how wealthy people structure their estates to reduce taxes. So it's been said that death taxes are optional. This is actually true. You're going to see, I'm going to walk through a lot of strategies here on this video, on this, if you're watching this live, it's a webinar. If, you, if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, it's it's recorded. But how do wealthy people pay less tax? Because I think, you know, you see this, you hear it, uh, you hear it seem it's a political issue, and I'm not going to get political but really, uh, it's it's a head scratcher for a lot of people. It's like, well, you know, how does Warren Buffett pay tax at a lower rate than his secretary or whatever it is? So, in that vein, we're gonna our primary focus is gonna be on uh, on wealth and transferring wealth. We're gonna touch a little bit on Prop 13, and and um, and that's very important because a lot of attorneys aren't particularly mindful of Prop 13. If you're watching this recorded on YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. This will pop up in your feed, and you'll be getting this information. We release these about weekly. We're, we're doing pretty much every Thursday. I'm a partner at Cunningham Legal, over 25 years experience. We have offices throughout California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law. Now, very, very few lawyers, if you look at the population as a whole, are certified specialists. Means I've got experience. I took an, an additional bar exam. Uh, I'm a real estate broker, securities and insurance licensed, and a pilot. These are the lawyers at our firm currently. So we have a great group of lawyers, um, a, uh, a very rich background um, you know, throughout the United States, and, and we're all here in California. This is a disclaimer, right? I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. This is not legal advice. I'm not kidding. Like, seriously, not legal advice. Don't look at this and say, I'm going to go out and do a bunch of stuff on my own. I think I can figure this out. It's really a bad idea because um, you can really get yourself into, into a lot of trouble. So you do need Savvy Estate Planning, which is the title of my book, Savvy Estate Planning. So um, you can buy that on, uh, on Amazon. It's Savvy Estate Planning, what you need to know before you hire the right lawyer. So what is wealth? We got to start, you know, uh, <laughs> it's been said. I'm taking this down to the basics, right? I'm not, if I'm, if my knowledge is a 10, I'm not taking it down to a six. We're going all the way down to one because what you think wealth is and what I as a lawyer think wealth is are two different things. And this is very, very important to establish what it is we're talking about, right? Because this, the subject is wealth. For most normal people, not lawyers, right? Because they're in the world, there are two kinds of people normal people, the regular people, right? And then there are lawyers, and I'm one of the lawyers. Most normal people think wealth is assets minus liabilities. If I have a home that's worth a million dollars and I have a $500 mortgage, a $500,000 mortgage, my net worth is 500,000, which is the equity. That's correct. That is a definition of wealth. But for estate purposes, this is very, very important to, to be uh, mindful of and pay attention to. And lawyers are really bad at explaining this. I will just tell you just straight up. Wealth is your gross estate. I will explain what gross estate is, minus liabilities plus lifetime taxable gifts. So what is your gross estates? Gross estate. It's everything that uh, it's certainly everything you own at death. It is also things that you control during your lifetime that pass at your death. So that would be the death benefit, that whole death benefit on life insurance, right? So if you have a life insurance policy with a million dollar cash value and a hundred thousand dollar cash value and a million dollar death benefit, what's included in your estate is a million dollars. So while you have that policy, you might think of it as a hundred thousand, but a lawyer right, is going to look at this and say, well, no, that's a million dollar asset. So when we're looking at your estate, we're, we're looking at these things. Annuities. Annuities uh, are great for some people. And, I'm, and you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, is a medium sized shirt right for you? Well, if, you know, you take an extra large, no, right, it's got to be a right fit. So annuities pass at death. Annuities also go <laughs> with an annuity, many times a pretty nasty income tax consequence, unless you uh, unless you have good um, good professional advice while you're alive. Uh, IRAs and 401ks, again, is if they're not a Roth, if it's not a Roth conversion, that's taxable as well. Joint tenancy property by default is fully included in your estate. So the, the IRS presumes that if you're a joint tenant, so if I have a piece of property and I add my son as a joint tenant, the IRS is going to tax that in my estate because they presume that I was, I was the one who kind of gave that half to my son. So very, very important. Um, so if Hal dies with a home worth a million dollars 
and an IRA worth a million dollars and insurance with a death benefit of $3 million, his gross estate, his taxable estate is $5 million. So while Hal's living, he's got a million dollar home and a million dollar IRA. He's like, hey man, I'm barely getting by in retirement in California. Uh, yeah, he's got a $5 million estate and we'll see that may be a taxable estate in the future. So what is wealthy? We're right at the tail end of 2022. We're in December of 2022, sort of the home stretch uh, for the year. We're looking at 2023, 24, and 25. Wealthy, right, is estates of 12.92 million in 2023 and a little bit more in 2024 and a little bit more in 2025, and we'll explain why. Everything beyond that, okay, so remember, this is your gross estate. This is your insurance, your IRAs, 401ks, everything. It's taxed at 40% on amounts over that $12,920,000 figure. That tax is due nine months after death. A lot of people don't can't really get their head wrapped around it because, you know, if your parents die and it may take you a month to get to the lawyer and then you're really confused and you've got grief and you've got all this stuff going on, you may not start figuring this out until six months into the process. Well, you got to cough up a big chunk of money uh, in three months, right, if you've waited six. So this is really important to be mindful of this and be prepared for it. Uh, certainly a married couple doubles up on that. Uh, if you're not a U.S. citizen, you don't get this. So for those of you who are maybe resident aliens and um, not a citizen, I encourage my clients, look, if your life is here, if your kids are here, if your whole world is here and you're not a citizen, become a citizen. Because if you're not a citizen, you're on a list. I mean, fundamentally, that's what's going on. So very pro, you know, people becoming citizens. I think it's very important. If your life is here, you also get a tremendous tax benefit. So it's something to pay attention to. So it also depends on what state you live in and where you own property in what state. So that's just federally 12.92 million. But many states, they start as low as a million dollars. So anything over a million, for example, in Oregon can be taxed up to 16%. And it's 20% in Washington. I think their threshold's a little bit over, over $2 million. So if you own typically tangible property in those states, you could be a California resident and own a commercial building in, in, um, in Oregon, that is potentially subject to Oregon uh, death tax. Now there's a workaround that's kind of outside of the scope of what we're talking about here. But my point is when thinking about wealthy, you can't ignore um, state death taxes. California, you're all good. There's no state death tax. Uh, and I also put in here, uh, wealthy people are also people who have uh, 500,000 if you're uh, married, uh, if you're a single filer or a million dollars if you're married filing jointly. So, um, and uh, we have a question here. Joy asked a question, do stocks and bonds need to be physically titled to your trust? Uh, Joy, great question. Um, there are two ways to hold a stock. One is the certificate, like the old ways, like the olden days, like, you know, where they would trade stocks under the Buttonwood tree at, 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 in Wall Street in New York City. Uh, or you can have what's called a street account. Now, a street account is with a, typically a financial advisor or institution. They hold those shares and then they hold them in an account. In both of those instances, those do need to be titled in the name of your, or should be titled in the name of your living trust. Otherwise, your trust is not funded. Now, don't go out and do that. I'm not giving you advice, but as a, on, a, on a very high level, as a, in a general sense, uh, those share certificates, if you want them in your living trust, should be titled in the living trust. And um, I was wealthy when I started this webinar, but now I'm not. Anonymous, well, wait. <laughs> I'm talking about this is all death taxes anonymous. So thank you very much. That's that's funny. I like that. I love humor. Great. Um, in 2026, it's going to be five million because it. What happened is in 2011, we got a five million dollar exemption, meaning a five million dollar coupon. You can leave five million tax free in 2011, adjusted for inflation. That was doubled, effective 2018. This is from the IRS's website. So how did the tax reform law change? Now, this is the one under the Trump administration. And I say that to reference a period of time, not a, in a political sense, those 2017, because there's the Obama exemption of 5 million and the Trump exemption of 5 million. You put those together, you have 10 plus inflation, okay? One's older, one's newer, and we'll, we'll get to that. The BEA is what's called the technical term for this coupon amount, the basic exclusion amount. And it was... Um, this is temporary. This doubling is temporary. So in 2026, it is going to be cut down in half. So now there's a little wrinkle here. It says, thus in 2026, the basic exclusion amount is due to revert to its pre-2018 level of 5 million as adjusted for inflation. That's not particularly clear. Is it as adjusted for inflation from 2011 
all the way to, or is there a gap? So I, I'm sure they'll come out and clarify. So here's what you need to know about 2026, and it is not pretty. The $12.92 million coupon that you have in 2023 that lets you leave $12.92 million effective January 1, which is next month, this expires at the end of 2025, and it gets cut in half. So if you think you might die with a gross estate, this is assets, including death benefit and life insurance, IRAs, 401ks, the net value of your assets, plus lifetime gifts if you've made those. If you think it's more than $5 million if you're single or $10 million if you're married, then your estate will be subject to a 45% rate on amounts over those 5 and $10 million thresholds. Now, again, those are indexed for inflation, but something to know is it's getting cut in half. $10 million is still a lot of money, objectively speaking. Okay. I mean, I think we can all agree with that. Uh, but I will tell you, my experience is lawyers who know this stuff, this takes a long time to learn the quantum of everything. I mean, this takes decades of experience. Okay. These people are retiring and they're retiring for many reasons. One is they're aging out, right? So baby boomers are, are retiring. COVID pushed a lot of people out where they just said, you know, forget it. I'm just going to quit working. And um, I will tell you that lawyers, the lawyers I talk to who know this stuff, everyone's very busy. So it's almost like there's no room at the end. So it's, you know, Christmas time, sort of the no room at the end, right? The baby Jesus thing. You may find that if you wait much longer, you know, if you wait until 2025, um, and some of these take years to implement, frankly, if you wait until 2025, it may be too late. So I would say if you're in this camp of people over 10 million, if you're married or over 5 million, if you're single, I would really hop on it. And, you know, you can certainly reach out to us, you can reach out to, you know, whomever, but, you know, it, you need to get on this. So this is not, certainly not a do it yourself project. You must have experts and this is not amateur hour. You do not want to have, you don't want to hire someone who's doing this for the first time because there are too many gotchas. Okay. Um, Something else to understand, when you give something of value, a check, for example, if it's more than 17,000 in 2020, 2023 and 2022, it's 16,000. If you give one person more than 17,000, you have to file a gift tax return, okay? Now this excludes like tuition payments to educational institutions, includes direct transfers to, to um, healthcare providers, medical providers. Um, you know, that's the exception that's not considered a gift. Uh, but if you give someone, you know, eighteen thousand dollars, you have to file a gift tax return and report that thousand dollars. So, when you make a taxable gift over seventeen thousand, that reduces that twelve point nine two million we saw in the last slide. That reduces dollar for dollar. So, if you give somebody twenty seven thousand in a year and you file a gift tax return and that gift is ta taxable as ten thousand, you don't pay any tax, but they're going to subtract ten thousand, right, from your exclusion amount, your coupon looked at another way, they're going to add back that 10,000 when you pass away to determine your tax. So these, um, you know, what we do in life kind of echoes in eternity, right? So to, to reference Marcus Aurelius, and in that, in that sense, the gifts you make during life, those cows do come home, um, uh, come back, the, or those, those cows come back to roost, I guess you could say. But something else to understand, if you're going to make a taxable gift, if you give that person $27,000, the $10,000 that comes back in or the $10,000 that's eroding your exemption amount, this coupon amount, this 12.92 million coupon amount, it is applied to the oldest exemption first. So something very important to understand. We have the Obama exemption from 2011, that's 5 million. We have the Trump exemption of 5 million. If you make a gift, you're making it off the bottom. You're making it off the Obama 2011 exemption. And a lot of professionals don't know this, okay? This is very nuanced. So that if you think, oh, I'm going to claim it on my Trump exemption that's going away, I'm going to use up that five or six million, whatever it is now adjusted for inflation, I'm going to use that. It doesn't work that way. So um, what does this mean? And if you're with me so far, um, what does this mean? In 2011, it was 5 million. In 2017, uh, it was doubled. The gifts are made first from your 2011 exclusion. So if you think you can pick and choose, you're mistaken. Unless you're giving, and the way the math works out, Unless you're giving more than 6.46 million, you're not even getting into that Trump extra 6.46 million exemption amount, right? So stated in another way, if you're making these gifts, it's the oldest exemption first. You have to burn through that entire exemption before you get to the 2017 exemption or coupon where you're kind of taking advantage of that. So something really to think about, it's like, well, how does that work? One basic strategy, a very fundamental strategy, if you have 
spouses. One spouse makes a gift of 12.92 million. The other spouse does not. And that's because it doesn't matter who dies first, but when the survivor of them dies, there will be at least that $5 million exemption adjusted for inflation because one spouse uses 12 million, the other spouse does nothing, that spouse still has a $5 million exemption adjusted for inflation, that spouse can die first, and the other spouse who made the gift can inherit the $5 million coupon from the spouse who passed away. So if you got that, great. If you didn't hit rewind, go through it again. Um, but it's very important that that you get this straight in your mind. So what are all the cool kids doing now? So what are the people who are wealthy who want to take advantage of this? What are they doing, right? Um, they're not waiting until 2025. And there are many reasons why you don't want to meet until 2025. We have a presidential election in two years, right? We will have, uh, you know, we're going to have an election. There will be a winner. There will be a loser. It's going to be over. We might have the same president. We might have a different president. I have no idea, right? Cases change all the time. This is case law going through the courts. Laws change. And, and importantly, regulations change. So Treasury can come out with regulations and say, well, you used to be could do this, and now you can't do that, or we're clarifying this. So this planning strategy doesn't work. This is a kind of a moving target. So these can change at any times. Many times, if you've already have it in place, you're good to go. Uh, but um, that's why it makes sense to do it earlier rather than later. Uh, and I would say the capacity or, you know, for the technical people out there, bandwidth. Uh, what I mean by bandwidth is the ability of professionals to meet the surge in demand. And these are not, you know, what we're going to talk about is not like doing a living trust with a lawyer, right? Lots of lawyers can do that. It's kind of limited in scope. As you go through this, you're going to see, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So I'm um, also baby boomers are retiring in droves. So now is the time to get your A-team together. This is a shot from the 80s A-team. This is not easy stuff. Your A-team consists of your lawyer, your CPA, your financial advisor. Those are the kind of the three pillars. Those are the people who really understand what's going on uh, in, in your life, if you will. So these are some threshold questions. I probably should have put these at the beginning. Do you care about taxes? You know, do you care enough to do something about it? Some of these structures have a level of complexity where some people say, no, I don't have headspace for that. I don't want to deal with it. I'll just pay the tax. Fine. I just don't want to, I don't want a complication in my life. Other people will say, I will do anything it takes to wring all the juice out of the orange and get keep all this money for my family and the and the government gets the least. Both are valid. Okay. So these both of these are valid, but um you know, you need to, we need to know, or, uh, lawyers need to know what your tolerance for complexity is because we can make things significantly more complex with significantly more tax benefit, but you have to be able to stomach the headspace on it, right? So just, just thinking about it. Uh, I think you should do some level of self-study. Obviously, you know, you're watching this video. It's, this is self-study. Uh, this is really, really important. You know, we live in this great age of, of, um, you know, all this information out there, some good, some bad. Uh, but, uh, and then also you need to get your head wrapped around the idea of paying professional fees. You're going to pay lawyers, you're going to pay CPAs, you're going to pay a financial advisor, appraisers, you know, that's a big kind of hidden expense, you, appraising property, appraising businesses, uh, and others. And you, you just need to be prepared for that. And really, you know, if you're going to make an omelet, you need to break a few eggs. If the professionals are not adding value, they should not be doing it, right? So we don't, if, if we see something, we go, wow, this is going to be really expensive for the client, but there's really no value there. We're not going to recommend it. So that's just, that's a professional ethics. Believe it or not, lawyers do have ethics, right? Um, and are you willing to invest the time, effort, and resources into the care and feeding of the structure? Because this is not a set it and forget it, you know, popeil like the roaster thing, right? This is not a set it and forget it, but you do have, to, this does require some maintenance. Now, you can contract that maintenance out with your, you know, your A-team. Uh, or you can, you know, be heavily involved. It's really is, it, it depends on on what you want to do. But this kind of goes to, you know, if you answer yes to these, then I think it makes sense to take the next step. But this is answering the question, how do wealthy people pay less tax? You know, they're thinking about it. They hire the right team. They just don't sign some papers and, you know, put them in a drawer. So there's a lot more going on here uh, than uh, than just signing some documents. Okay. I call this the ice cream truck test. So when a client comes in, Rich or poor, married or single, healthy or not, young or old, the first thing any estate lawyer is going to do is ask himself or herself, 
if this client died today, if they got hit by an ice cream truck and died, okay, there's a companion question, which is if you get hit by an ice cream truck and don't die, but can't take care of yourself, separate set of issues. I think you can see that. But if you're hit by an ice cream truck and, and killed, what would happen? Who owns what? Who's in charge? What's included in your estate? What are the taxes going to be? What does all that look like? And certainly, what if you don't die? And what if you were hit on New Year's Day in 2026? So we look at two, well, and then, then also, actually, if you die of old age, let's say you don't get hit by the ice cream truck, but you die of old age. You know, we, we kind of look at those three periods of time. Now, for many people, um, it's, it's not particularly difficult. Here's my house. Here's my IRAs and my 401ks. Here's my stock portfolio. Here it is. Very straightforward. Other people come to us and they say, well, I've got a half interest in this property with a partner and I've got a two thirds interest in this other property with a partner and I have my own business and I inherited money from my parents and it's in a trust and I've already made gifts to my kids and I have, you know, I have this existing estate plan. You can see that it really depends on your situation. And what we typically do is if we cannot readily and immediately discern what the issues are and kind of do a, some quick math on it. Uh, there is an engagement where, you know, we go through this process to determine and we map it out and we use spreadsheets and we, we generate a report that says, you know, if you pass away today, this is what it looks like. If you pass away in 2026, this is what it looks like. And if you live your, you know, your kind of projected life expectancy minus what you're going to spend during your lifetime, this is what it looks like. And that's really the starting point. Um, I do want to talk about care and feeding. Uh, part of this is like the battery's not included. You know, when you're, you remember when you were a kid and you get that present and you go, oh, right, you know, the remote controlled car and then you flip it over, battery's not included. And you're just like, oh no, I got to go get batteries. You're killing me. Um, there isn't batteries not included element to this. Um, you typically, what, what we see, you know, the more complex it matters. And as we go through the examples here, the bigger the numbers, the more likely this is to happen. Um, it's the professionals who are the batteries and they're involved and, and the lawyer typically is the project manager. Manager Sometimes it's the CPA, but um, I really pity CPAs. They're sort of on that wheel of deadlines with the IRS. It seems like every month there's a new deadline, right? Um, lawyers uh, typically in a, in a practice like ours, which is not litigation, it's, it's you know, we're not doing court work. We're, we're doing transactional work. We have a bit more, um, we have more control over our time. So we don't have these necessarily these artificial uh, deadlines. So we end up typically being the project managers. Uh, but I would also say that, you know, choose your advisors um, carefully, uh, do your research. Obviously technical competence is required, uh, but this oftentimes is a lengthy and deep relationship with your advisors that can last generations. And we do see this in California. It's actually very common on the East Coast of the United States where people might have, you know, families might have been around for two or 300 years. And it's just like this relationship, right, that they have with, with you know, the sort of institutional relationship. Uh, we do see that to a lesser extent um, in California just because we haven't been a state as long. Um, but I, I, I would also counsel you, which is not legal advice, uh, ask your advisor, what is their succession plan? You know, um, there are a lot of professionals out there. They're, they're one man or one woman shops. That's okay for some tasks, um, but I'm telling you, we, we don't live forever. We don't practice law forever. This, these plans that are written can last, frankly, for hundreds of years, okay? So it's very important to pick the right team. Make sure you've got a succession plan in place. Our firm, full disclosure, does have a succession plan. Um, so an example of care and feeding, Helen wanted to create a holding company. We'll explain what that is. Five LLCs, limited liability company, a GRAT, grant to retain annuity trust. We'll explain that. Charitable trust and two dynasty trusts. That sounds really complicated, right? There's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, these things do not, absolutely do not run themselves. They do require, require appropriate care and feeding. And, um, you know, we have a family office in, in, in our firm and we help clients, you know, that, who set these structures up. That is an annual engagement where we're paying attention to things. And right now we're going through this sort of last call of income tax planning for people as they kind of near the end of the year, they go, well, wait a minute, you know, I want to pay less tax. And so we're, we're working with them uh, now. So I do want to talk about... Um, on a very, very high level, there are two fundamental, there are two fundamental um, methods of planning. And if you're a lawyer watching this, you're gonna go, I've never heard it expressed that way. Uh, but this is how I 
am trying to translate it to, <laughs> to people who aren't uh, lawyers and don't have a lot of professional experience in this. There are ownership strategies and there are loaning strategies. So in the world, there are owners and there are loaners and that's it. You know, you can buy a stock, you own the company, you can buy a bond, you know, you can buy Apple stock or buy an Apple bond, you're a loaner, you're loaning money to Apple in that, in that sense. So ownership strategies include taxable transfers of a property, right? It's where you transfer ownership. Um, it has the purpose of, it, it, it has the effect of shifting future growth to others, typically, you know, the kids, if you've got children. So, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I have this, um, I've got kids and I've got this asset that I know is going to go up over time and it's worth 12920000 I'm going to give it to the kids because I know I'm going to live another 30 years and the thing will be worth $40 million, but it will be outside of my estate. And that's what I'm talking about when the, a transfer strategy. So that's where you're just kind of transferring to the kids. We typically put that in a trust wrapper and we'll cover that. Um, this also does include tax deferral strategies. So I would put that in the bucket of ownership. So this is where you're transferring property. Loaning strategies, um, a very powerful tool is the arbitrage or the difference between the interest that the IRS requires you to charge on a loan, if you're lending people something, uh, and then the return on the investment. And historically speaking, um, the S&P 500 has returned over the last 30 years a little bit more than 10% minus last year. And the um, interest rates are about 2.7. So I, I just kind of, these are examples, right? So, um, and, and you'll see this structure, this loaning structure at work. So the difference between 10 and 2% can go tax-free to the kids, right? And, and we'll see a structure. So there's ownership um, and loanership, I guess you could call it structures. So let's look at some, some basic uh, gifting principles. So Strings versus no strings. Um, a gift can have no strings attached. Here's, you know, Johnny, here's your check for a million bucks. Well, thanks, Dad. I really appreciate that. It's very nice of you. Um, you know, you file your gift tax return. Gifts can have strings attached. And this is where we get into issues of ownership versus control. So um, owners are entitled to the economic benefit. They're the beneficiary. Benefit, beneficiary. That's how you can remember who the beneficiary is. Uh, people who control decide when the owners get theirs. And the example we use is Owen gives Bob $100. He says, Bob, this $100 is yours. I'm holding it in my hand, right? And I'll decide, Bob, when you can spend the money. So Bob, this is your $100, but I control when you get it. And you know, is this really a gift? Um, what about those strings? How many strings? What types of strings can we have attached? And that's really where, you know, the lawyers and CPAs and financial advisors come in on, on that one. Um, so this is a, a short list of, of gifting strategies. These are fundamentally uh, gifting strategies. I, there, there are a whole world, whole universe of, pop, of possibilities on trusts. A lot of these are mashed up and combined in different ways. I'm just kind of like giving you a list of Legos, right? If we're, I loved Legos as a kid. And we assemble these in different ways to come up with, with a unique estate plan. But I do want to touch on a concept, and this is slightly technical, grantor versus non-grantor. Your living trust uh, typically is a grantor trust. So husband and wife create a trust, and, and they're the, the beneficiaries, and, and, and they set up the trust, and, and they're living in the house, and they're in control. Uh, it, that is a revocable trust, and that under the Internal Revenue Code, right, which decides taxation, that is what is called a grantor trust, meaning you don't have to file a separate income tax return. You report that on your own income tax return. So if I have a bank account in my living trust and I get interest, even though that interest comes in the name of my living trust, that goes on my personal income tax return. So the trust is essentially um, ignored for income tax purposes. A non-grantor trust is not ignored. A non-grantor trust typically charge it's typically you're paying tax at the highest rate at about a little over $13,000 in income. So really different. We use as practitioners in this field, a lot of irrevocable trusts. So your revocable trust, you can change. We use irrevocable trusts that are grantor trusts. So very basically, if I, if I'm going to sell Apple stock and I want to give that money to my kid, I can sell the stock, pay the taxes, right? And then give the money 
Now I'm paying the taxes and then he's getting less because he's getting the net on that. I can give him the stock, but I'm using up some of my exemption because when he turns around and sells that Apple stock, it's going to reduce, um, that, that money's just going to go to the government and that money that goes in taxes, I've had to, I've had to put that on, on a gift tax return, right? So one method, a very basic method, is I can set up an irrevocable trust that is a grantor trust. So that money goes into the trust that full, let's say it's a million dollars, that full million dollars is for my son. And when that stock is sold, I pay the tax personally. Now, the advantage of that is that I pay the tax, I'm burning, because the tax is going to get paid. Either I'm going to pay it, my son's going to pay it but it is an optimal or an optimized, the most efficient tax structure. Now, if you didn't get that, that's fine. We're kind of hitting the, on the very high level of different strategies, but I want you to know that sometimes an irrevocable trust can be a grantor trust. Does not mean it's included in your estate, but what it does mean is that you are still deemed the taxpayer, even though you don't own the property. Now, some of you may say, well, that, that deal kind of sucks, right? But if you're a wealthy person, you're going to pay, you know, it's either your kid's going to pay it or you're going to pay it. And it makes more sense for you to pay it. Uh, generation skipping, AKA also known as a dynasty trust. So um, I want to clarify. Uh, so Joya, I'm sorry, one question. Joya, does a spouse get carry forward of the deceased spouse for basic exclusion amount? Yeah, Joy, what you're talking about there is do you inherit the basic exclusion amount? Yes, you have to file a form 706. You now have five years to do it. If you have a spouse that died, within the last five years and you haven't filed your 706, you need to get on it because they just changed the rule on that not too long ago. So very important, Joy, I'm glad for you asked that question. If you've lost a spouse and you did not file a form 706, the federal estate tax return, you need to talk to an expert like today. Like when this is done, get on the phone and, and call somebody because there's a five-year deadline and you can pick up this extra exemption. We have no idea what the laws are gonna be in the future. You know, we used to have a very low death tax exemption. It was $60,000. The maximum tax rate was 77%. Now, I don't know about you, but I am a realist. The government put so much money into the economy during COVID. They have to take it out of the economy somehow. Otherwise, we're going to have runaway inflation. Well, you know, we're in it. I think taxes are going to go way up. That's my personal belief is, um, you know, we've run up such a debt. Even the Republicans, I saw Paul Ryan speaking. He says, we can't, like, we can't spend like this. We got to throttle it back, people, because we're saddling our grandkids with tremendous debt, and this is going to have to be paid. So slight digression, but the point is um, we may have very significantly higher taxes in the future. We just don't know, okay? And, and we may not have a choice, all right? And, and we may collectively come together as Americans and say, yeah, we kind of have to have high taxes, right, um, to, to, you know, to pay all the benefits we, we've promised. So generation skipping trust versus dynasty trust, kind of the same thing right? Generation skipping trust does not mean that it skips a person, right? So if I give property, if I put property into a generation skipping trust for my son, I'm not skipping him. Now, I don't have grandkids yet. I'm not skipping him. He's the beneficiary. The generation skipping trust refers to the generation skipping um, transfer tax, right? And using up, there's a, I didn't even mention this, there's a generation skipping transfer tax exemption amount that happens to equal the basic exclusion amount of 12.92 million. You might see these referred to as dynasty trusts. I kind of like dynasty trust. It sounds a little sexier than generation skipping trust. It sounds like you're taking something away from somebody. Um, but this is a common or uh, they can be a common or pot trust or separate share trust. So, and I'll, we have an example we'll go through a spousal lifetime access trust. That's where I give money to my wife and it's out of my estate and out of her estate. Um, very common. Uh, it was kind of the flavor du jour a couple of years ago. Qualified personal residence trust having to do with residence, a grant or retained annuity trust. We'll talk about that charitable trust and then we'll finish with entities. So uh, I'm going to bring to you a concept of the holding company. All right. So what is a holding company? Companies can op be operating companies. Um, Apple is an operating company. Uh, a holding company can be a company that just holds shares of other uh, of other companies. And that's what a holding, they're holding, you can think of it as like holding the share certificates of another company. That holding company is not out selling stuff, doing business. Uh, and there really is a divide between the operating versus non-operating companies. And, and you'll see, you'll see why we have holding companies here in a little bit, but let's say Helen wanted to have a $50 million estate and they create a holding company. Uh, they put 50 million into the hold co Helen wanted to get their own lawyers. You kind of have to do this and agree that 12.92 million of hold co uh, is Hal's property, and that goes into a trust. 
and Wanda and the kids are all beneficiaries. So that is a method where Hal can burn one exemption, okay? And let's say it's 50 million in securities, right? So a brokerage account that's not an operating company. The holding company has, you know, a passive investment account. That strategy is a spousal lifetime access trust plus a dynasty trust put together. And that strategy will burn, will help Hal burn 12.92 million, use up that exemption. Wanda still has her 12.92 million. If Hal and Wanda live until 20, I don't know, 20 whenever, uh, the survivor of Wanda and Hal will still have a death tax exemption. So the worst thing that Hal and Wanda could do would be each to give, uh, what is that, six and a half million bucks? Because now they none of them would have a death tax exemption. So this is why you need to go to an expert because I'm telling you, a lot of lawyers don't know this stuff, okay? A lot of CPAs, I'm not sure they know it either. So, um, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing the professions. I'm just saying uh, this is complex stuff. So um, the future growth passes free of death taxes and some jurisdictions, you know, uh, Nevada, you can have this go out 360 years. There are other jurisdictions that can go out a thousand years, kind of nuts. But um, I would suspect the government would crack down on that at some point in the future. But, you know, these are fairly recent laws. Um, so I'm not sure that 360 years is, is real. Um, it's just my personal belief, but I think the government's going to need more money. Hal and Wanda have, uh, again, they have a $50 million estate. Um, and this looks like it might be a repeat. No? Okay. Next, Hank and Wendy. Husband and wife, Hal and Wanda, Hank and Wendy. You get it. Uh, Hank and Wendy have a $100 million estate in real estate. And this is, this is going to, the reason I'm, the reason these numbers are big is just because they're easy to deal with. Uh, but also, um, in this instance, your the properties will not be reassessed uh, when when you do this structure. So it's kind of cool if it's done properly. Hank and Wendy have a $100 million real estate portfolio, um, and they create Holdco. Uh, Hank transfers $20 million of Holdco to a trust. $20 million, not $12.92. Are you catching that? He can transfer more. Because the assets are real estate. Real estate's really a cool asset. You can, you can get discounts for lack of marketability and control, meaning you can transfer $20 million of value and only be taxed as if it's 12.92 million. I kind of juiced that number up a little bit because I didn't want a bunch of, it was, it's, a, it's like 19 point something, but I just rounded it up to 20 just for, for illustration purposes here. But you're able to, so Hank is able to transfer 20 million in property but have it only be taxed on a transfer tax basis of 12.92 million. It's pretty cool. Wendy can do the same thing. Okay. So what you're able to do is you're able to transfer $40 million in property and only be taxed on 12.92 million. And because you have not transferred more than 50% of this entity, and I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying by the way. So this is not a structure. I'm just trying to teach a concept because not more than 50% has, has transferred this transaction will not result in a reassess or shouldn't result in a reassessment. It could if you screw it up. Anita asks, this may be a dumb question, but are Wanda and the kids needing to protect that 12.9 million and do some work on that? Uh, no, the trustee handles that. Yeah, I mean, Wanda can be involved. Uh, it just depends on 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 the plan. But, uh, but yeah, what we're talking about here is how do you get from point A to point B? How do you make a gift with keeping some strings attached? Because, you know, let's face it, if Hal... Um, transfers, if, if Hal puts 12.92 million in a trust for Wanda and he says, well, Wanda, can, can you take some money out of that trust and, and, you know, put it in your account and pay for our vacation? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of essentially you're accessing it through, through the back door. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the basic design, you know, you gotta be careful with that. You have to be really careful in fact. Uh, but that's kind of the idea there is that there's some access, um, that that uh, Wanda has some access on that. So why are Hal and Wanda and Hank and Wendy even doing this? This sounds really complicated, Jim. Why on earth are they doing this? Because there is a freebie where you can give an extra 6.4 million per person until 2026, then it goes away. This saves at least 2.9 million taxes for each spouse and a total of at least 5.8 million. It's use it or lose it. This is a huge freebie. So if you have an estate that's large, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, seriously, like, why wouldn't you do this? It's, it's a complete freebie. I mean, you can think of it as kind of part of this big government handout that's been going on for the last couple of years. Uh, and this will all end, right, folks? This, this will all end because this legislation sunsets in 2026. 
Why does it sunset? It did not get 60 votes in the Senate. So that's the rule. If you don't get 60 votes in the Senate, bills like this sunset after 10 years. And I would caution you, you know, whether you do planning with us or whether you do planning with somebody else, don't wait. A lot of these structures take a very long time to design, build, and implement um, months, maybe a year. If you wait until 2025, you may not just have enough time left. The laws might have changed, but good luck finding anyone who knows uh, about this because I'm telling you, I'm talking to my colleagues, everyone's busy. Um, everyone's busy. So uh, let's see here. We talked about that. We talked about that. We talked about that. All right. Spousal Lifetime Access Trust. We kind of saw this a little bit in the last example, but I do want to just, kind of, this is the pure Spousal Lifetime Access Trust. Uh, Hal and Wanda have a $30 million estate. The point I'm going to drive here is if Hal wants to give $12 million to Wanda, they have to go to their own lawyer and convert that from community, I'm assuming it's community property, from community to separate property. So Wanda says, yeah, Hal, that 12.92 million, you can do whatever you want with that. So once he, he says, all right, it's my separate property, then he puts it into the, um, the spousal lifetime access trust and that future growth and all that other good stuff happens outside of Hal's estate and Wanda's estate. I would say this is a very common strategy for affluent families who want to uh, save a few million dollars in, in death taxes. This can actually be very useful if we drop the kids and just have Wendy on there as a beneficiary. This can also be extremely useful in avoiding reassessment because changes in ownership between spouses are not considered um, changes in ownership. Transfers between spouses are not changes in ownership by statute in California. In California, the assessor's office disregards a trust and they look at who, what is called the income beneficiary, like who's the person who would be entitled to the rents if this property were rented out. So if you have a property that goes into a spousal lifetime access trust and Wanda is the benef is the income beneficiary, that should not result in a reassessment. If you have the kids in there, you got a problem, but with Wanda, it should not result in reassessment. Uh, and this can be a very powerful strategy uh, for obvious reasons, because many of our clients, uh, they're very concerned about uh, reassessment because you know a lot of people bought properties a long time ago that have gone just crazy expensive. I was talking with a, a client recently uh, in Marin County and, and he was selling a property he'd owned I don't know, 35 years. And I said, did you think you'd sell that little house for a million dollars? He's like, I had no, like no idea the numbers would get that big. So, um, all right, qualified personal residence trust. How long want to have a home? It's worth 2 million. And they create a qualified personal residence trust. Now, what is this? Well, normally a qualified personal residence trust solves a very uh, common problem. If you're a rich person, let's say you're the Rockefellers, you got a beach home. I'm going to give the beach home to the kids. And then you keep going to the beach home. You can't do that. If you give something away and keep using it, that comes back into your estate. Internal Revenue Code 2036, black letter law, you're going to lose that one, okay? It's just, you're not going to win that argument. There is a carve out for personal residences, okay? Now, this is where th there's a difference here. This is by statute, passed in 1969, so it's been around a long time. There is no uh, maximum term for a qualified personal residence trust. If Helen Wanda do not survive the 20 year term, that asset comes back into their estate. Okay, comes back into their estate. Uh, but they have a home worth $2 million. They create a qualified personal residence trust uh, where they live in the home for 20 years. Now, if they want to sell the home, they can. If they don't want to live, if they want to sell the home and convert it to some other asset, they can do that. There's a lot of flexibility on the Cupert. Um, but when they're after that 20 years, that home becomes a property. The children likely will be reassessed, um, unfortunately. Uh, but title transfers to the children and the value of the gift is what is the, the leftover. So let's say their retained interest is, is 800,000. And I did not do the math on this. So if you're a lawyer watching this and you'd say, well, your numbers are off, I'm just driving home a concept. Helen wanted to create a Cupert and their retained interest. So they make a gift. We're in 2022. They make a gift in 2022. They're keeping 800,000. So the $2 million gift to the residents that they're giving their kids is only taxed as if it's 1.2 million. So stated another way, when the parents give the house, they are not giving the whole house. They are giving part of the house and retaining the right to live there for a term of years. And, um, and that has a value based on the value of the residents, the age of the client, 
and the um, uh, applicable interest rate. So these are all variables that can change. Um, but it, it, the whole point is when the kids inherit the home 20 years from now and it's worth 5 million, they're taxed as if it's 1.2 million. So 3.8 million goes free of transfer tax. And I think if you're paying attention, you can see, well, you know, I could put a cupert together with a holding company with this and that, and this is the direction we're going. So I'm going through kind of the ingredients in the in the soup, if you will. Uh, but every everyone's soup has different ingredients. Every, all the soups taste different. It it just is highly customized for your situation. Um, a sale to an irre, uh, irrevocable grantor trust. So also known as an intentionally defective grantor trust. I don't like the word defective because clients don't like it. They're like, why are you giving me a defective trust? But it's out there. Uh, Hal has a $50 million estate and owns a stock portfolio of 10 million. Hal gifts a million dollars to an irrevocable trust. Psh, he's burned a million bucks. He then sells $9 million to a trust. Now, wait a minute. If you sell something, don't you have to pay capital gains taxes? Well, in this case, remember I mentioned the grantor trust, that if you're um, the created grantor trust and you're the grantor, you are deemed the taxpayer. Well, if you sell something to yourself, guess what? You don't pay any capital gains tax, right? So the property then, so you burned a million of your exemption. You then sell uh, $9 million of securities portfolio. Now you have to, you take in exchange a note that pays 2% interest, okay? Over time, the stock portfolio, this $10 million stock portfolio returns 10% a year. So the 8% difference, if you're following this, this is an arbitrage strategy, the 8% increase every year in value goes to the next generation, goes to the kids, goes wherever it goes. And this is it, what is called an estate freezing technique. Now, I ran the numbers over the last 30 years. And the average short-term rate that is charged is about half a percentage point higher than the average inflation rate. And I didn't include this year. Um, because we're not over with the year, at least not yet. Um, so it's very important to understand that it kind of correlates with inflation. So when you say, well, I got to pay 10, 2%, that means I'm, I'm getting money back. Well, yeah, but you're also your death tax exemption is increasing you know, with, with inflation. Um, and, and really, this is a, a very valuable tool to freeze the value of an estate and shift that future growth to the next generation. So very common strategy used by many, many clients. Grantor retained annuity trust is, is a little bit similar, uh, similar concept. Uh, rich people use grants to transfer wealth to the next generation and avoid a transfer tax. So this is lending. This is a lending strategy. Remember I talked that you can be an owner or a loaner. This is a lending strategy. And if you pass the hurdle rate, and that's what it's called, the hurdle rate, it's all good. The government, um, you know, if you lend somebody something, three things have to happen. Number one, you have to charge interest, right? Interest must be paid at some point. There must be security, right? Personal guarantee, um, you know, some type of, of security interest, whatever it is. Um, a note secured by deed of trust is a security interest. And third, you must have repayment of the principal. So if you borrow money, you actually have to pay the princi principal back uh, as well as the interest and have security. And the hurdle rate refers to the, um, the interest that is charged. And, and, I'm, and we'll see an example here in the next slide. Um, so the government makes you charge this certain amount, and these rates are published every month. And to the extent the assets have a greater return, that goes to the next generation, in our example, free of transfer tax. Now, there's I'm not talking income taxes here. I'm talking transfer taxes. So Hal puts a million dollars into a two-year grant. He gets a million forty thousand back on the deal. But during the term of the trust, the assets go up to one point one four million meaning there's an extra 100,000 left over, right? So you, you, Hal puts his money into a grat and he gets back some money, but then it went up to 1.14 million. He gets back a million 40,000. What happens to that 100,000? That goes to the next generation free of a 40% transfer tax. So it's 40%. So um, this is uh, oftentimes used for people who either want to preserve their death tax exemption amount. And this is also used for people who, who have exhausted right? Their, their um, exemption amount. But if it's done over a long period of time, I, I think it can be an extremely effective way of transferring wealth free of gift taxes. Um, but what if you don't make your hurdle rate of 2%? You know, the market's down this year. That is when uh, you say, Houston, we have a problem.
right? You're that's an issue, right? That's outside of the scope of what we're talking about here, but you want to make sure and um, and you, you don't want to have that problem. So you do have to, again, care and feeding, you got to pay attention to it. Irrevocable life insurance trust. Lots of people, lots of people use this. It's a way of, you can think of this as prepaying your death taxes for pennies on the dollar. Death taxes are, you know, death is inevitable. You're going to have an estate. How do you minimize the catastrophe of, of, uh, of, of bad planning or not having sufficient liquidity. The death benefit, of, something very important to understand, again, the death benefit, death benefit of life insurance that pays out to people is included in your estate. The problem is it doesn't stay in your estate. These three people are beneficiaries. They get this money. Who pays the tax bill? Right? So there's kind of an issue there. I mean, the one kind of fundamental issue. But Helen wanted to have a $30 million estate. They have three kids. They create a life insurance trust, an irrevocable life insurance trust. And they transfer $100,000 per year to the trustee, uh, not, and Helen Wanda can't be the trustee. And they make these gifts on a tax-free basis because they can each give six, 17,000 each child for a total of 102. And because the premium is 100,000, it's coming in under the 102. They're not using any death tax exemption, all right? And the $5 million death benefit goes tax-free to the kids, saving 2.25 million in taxes because I'm presuming a 45% tax rate. It also provides a source of liquidity. It's very important because remember, taxes are due nine months after death. This provides a pot of $5 million where the life insurance trust could buy assets from the estate. And that's really how it works on the back end. The life insurance trust buys assets from the estate. The estate transfers those assets to the irrevocable life insurance trust. Now the estate has the liquidity to pay the tax. So 100,000 goes into the bucket, 5 million goes to the kids tax-free. All is good. Charitable trusts. We have a whole webinar on charitable trusts. I'm not going to get in the weeds on this. Uh, there are different kinds. And, uh, but here's, you know, charitable trusts can be used for different things. What we see very, a very common strategy is a tax deferral strategy. So Hal has a $10 million position in Apple stock with, you know, $100,000 cost basis. He creates what we call a 20 year zeroed out CRUT, charitable remainder unit trust. Hal transfers the 10 million in stock to the charitable trust. Stock is sold. There's no tax paid. That tax is deferred. That tax is spread out over 20 years. And he gets about 600,000 a year for 10 years. And after 10 years, well, actually, this should be 600,000 a year for 20 years. And after 20 years, a million goes to charity or whatever, whatever the numbers are here. I, that was a mistake. So uh, why tax bracket arbitrage, right? So what we're doing here is instead of lumping all that money in one year, that 600,000 is spread out over a period of years, and he's able to use our graduated tax brackets to pay less tax overall and have that money invested. So the other way to look at this is instead of giving three and a half million in ca capital gains taxes to the state and federal government, that three and a half million stays in the trust and is working and delivering a return to Hal. So many people do this. Minimum 10% has to go to charity. Uh, here's another example with the house. Um, this is a very common strategy. Many of our clients have a home that's gone, you know, way up in value that they didn't pay much for. And they're like, hey, I'm going to sell this and move. So you can transfer the home to the trust. The trust then sells the home. Uh, on a charitable remainder trust, you have to be getting meaning, meaning you get the money for a period of time or for your life. And then when you're gone, the money goes to charity. You have to receive at least 5% um, or more in income from, from the trust. And the charity has to get at least 10%. So we've got some uh, webinars on this on our uh, on our YouTube page. I'd encourage you to check that out. And we'll finish here with entities, LLCs, partnership, or corporation. Um, which is best? I'm going to give you 30,000 foot level. Real estate typically goes into a partnership or LLC, taxed as a partnership or disregarded entity. So I kind of, I am inverting this and not talking about the entity. I'm talking about what type of assets going in there. So what we see with clients a lot of times they will either have real estate or they will have an operating business, okay? If it's an operating business, um, S or a C corp, and those are just, an S corp does not pay tax on the corporate level, except the one and a half percent to California. The C corp pays tax at the corporate level, and then the dividends are taxable with an S corp. You don't have that corporate level tax, and you can also have an LLC that is taxed as a corporation. So LLCs are very flexible. We did a webinar on this. Um, a little bit ago, and I would encourage you to check that out. We really get in the weeds on that. General partnerships generally are not a good idea. 
you have unlimited liability. Each general partner has unlimited liability and limited partnerships are kind of clunky. I think uh, the LLC tax as a partnership has kind of taken over the, the limited partnership in, in many ways. Um, so uh, let's look, Helen Wanda own XYZ Corp. All right, it manufactures widgets. The factory is owned by 123 Maple LLC because the factory is at 123 Maple Street. So we just say, all right, it's a 123 Maple LLC. And that's taxed as a partnership. And the operating business, XYZ Corp, is a California S Corp. So the corporation leases the factory from 123 Maple. Now, why would you do that? You really want to think twice before you have real estate that is owned by an S Corp because when you go to sell that property, it's basically taxed as ordinary income. But by the time it, it by the time everything you, you go through everything, it's basically ordinary income. You also do not get a step up in basis on property. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Helen Wander gonna, gonna take a salary from XYZ Corp. XYZ Corp is paying rent to their LLC. Hal, Hal and Wanda get um, the rents flowing back to them because they own the LLC. When Hal dies, Wanda on 123 Maple LLC, she gets a step up in basis under Internal Revenue Code Section 754 uh, because it's community property, meaning she gets a full adjusted cost basis and she can sell that property free of capital gains tax because she is tired of making widgets. Um, holding company. Let's say Helen want to have lots of assets and they put them in a holding company. They can gin, then gift the shares of their holding company to one or more dynasty trusts and retain control of the entity and transfer wealth to the next generation. Uh, and they're able to take advantage of the $12.92 million exemption. So in watching this, I want you to say, hmm, holding company, LLC, I see the pattern here. It's, there's, there is an appropriate level of complexity uh, because this is actually, I'm mean, gonna this example here. How long want to have five properties? Each LLC owns one property. Now, you could have those all as partnerships, for example, but then you'd have five partnership returns. It's a little bit easier to have a holding company that in turn holds all the sh LLC shares, right? And those would be taxed as what we call a disregarded entity, meaning you file like a partnership, one partnership return, five state returns, but you're not filing five federal partnership returns on the five LLCs. So uh, believe me, this, this actually is a simpler way uh, for many of our clients. It, this may not be the way, you know, if you do some, a structure that's similar to this, this may not be the structure that you use. So it just depends on what's, what's appropriate. Um, but this is a simpler way than having five partnership returns. Um, uh, Anita asked, have you, or will you do a webinar on the best way to save taxes if someone's not wealthy as identified in this webinar? Yeah, we have. Uh, but again, you know, it's, it, you know, saving taxes, um, there's a value add, um, you know, issue. If, if someone's making $100,000 and they want to save $2,000, i am not sure it's, you know, when, when you look at the fees we'd be charging, I'm not sure it's worth it. That's why I put that $500,000 million threshold. So holding company structure, um, you know, here's a, for example, the holding company is where it says holding company is holding the shares of the LLC. Maybe mom and dad keep 1% and they transfer 99% to a dynasty trust for the kids. And that uh, now has transferred 99%. And maybe this equals, um, you know, about $26 million when you have the 12.92 million combined, but the parents are still in control. Okay. This is really, really important. This is the ownership versus control. And this is, the basic structure that many families use to hold um, a significant portfolio of assets. And, and many times it, it's, it's real estate, but that's a good one. That's probably screenshotable. Um, that's just the basic concept. Now, you don't have to put everything in there. Can you put some? Yes. Are there Prop 13 issues on this? Yes. Um, and that's why we take it very carefully, um, sort of one, one brick at a time. That concludes our webinar. I would encourage you to ask, put your questions up there. We do have offices throughout California. We do have attorneys licensed in other jurisdictions. Subscribe to us on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. And you know, if you're enjoying these uh, or you're a past client or you just like what we're doing, please review us on Google. That is very helpful. And we do have market insights for 2023 with Phil Blancato. He's a uh, uh, works in New York City. Uh, running Ladenberg Thalman. So he's a really smart, insightful guy. You can go ahead and scan that if you'd like and, um, and reserve for that webinar, but he's going to give us his insights into what's in store for next year. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, um, as we wrap up here, uh, that date is now, yes. 
Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, December 8th. Yeah, it's next week. Hey, thank you for pointing that out. So will that be the 15th? Um, one more question. Thanks, Jim. All's, all right. Uh, wow, my head hurts. Yeah, well, my head hurt putting this thing together. So I, I hear you. But if you're watching this on YouTube, keep watching because the next video when we're done, the next video, it just kind of rolls and you can just listen to this for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm.